мені потрібно сказати правду. Now I understand that I have to tell the truth about this war to stop speculation in 200 years. Something like the Russian army was defending the Russian speaking citizens. They pulled the dead bodies in one bulk and then they set them on fire, the piles of dead bodies to destroy the evidence of their war crimes. Яке воно все виявилося огидно. Hello, I'm Jenny Klochka. Today in Kyiv I meet artist Evgenia Kapchinska. And uh, she's the creator of the world where love is all around. Evgenia Kamchinska is one of those artists who was the most recognizable in Ukraine, still is, uh, the most expensive, and having her pictures, it's uh, always, uh, to have her pictures at home, it's something positive, something optimistic, it's something very inspiring. Hello. Good morning. How are you feeling today? How is your mood? My mood is awful and tired. But it has become a habit for the last two years. Today is not that bad. Before we start our interview, I would like to tell you something. You may have heard it from many people. It is about how your paintings appeared in my life. I must warn you, I am far from the art. I am not an expert. There was a cafe with French pancakes when I was a student and lived in Kiev. And from time to time, I could afford to go there on very, very special occasions to try the French pancake, as it was said. There were your paintings on the walls. It was very special for me as a young university student who tried to find my place in life in Kiev. I just started the job. It was a moment of positivity and optimism. I felt optimistic about my future when I was there among those paintings having that French pancake. It was going to get even better. I don't know what happened to the calf, but you created the world and carried on doing it no matter what. What do you think of it? Did you realize that you gave these pockets of happiness and joy? Людиною, яка дає оці ем, кишеньки щастя, кишеньки радості. Ви знаєте, я думала про це нещодавно. Я все життя своє, ще з самого-самого початку малювання, я дала собі обіцянку, що я ніколи не буду малювати про білі. Я you know, I was thinking about it the other day. All my life. From the very beginning of art in my life, I've promised to myself I will never be painting about the pain. There is enough pain in the world, I should not increase it. I wanted to be the artist of joy and happiness. The pain of war is accumulating, and I didn't know how I could show it in my works. If I had a right to let it in in my pictures, my son solved it for me. When my husband was injured, he drew it with one line in the hospital. There was one good arm and the other was injured. It surprised me very much how bravely, without second thought, drew, he drew his dad with an injured arm. It became a sign for me. My son gave me the courage to let the war into my paintings. That's how I drew my favorite work, The Defender, with a pink unicorn. Everyone knows the meaning of the unicorn. It's a creature as a bridge between good and evil. Not everyone can see it. It's a mythical creature with a pure soul. That was the first time when this injured arm appeared. Now I understand that I have to tell the truth about this war to stop speculation in 200 years. Something like the Russian army was defending the Russian-speaking citizens. This truth has leaked into my works. It was the right thing to do. It was natural. The artist is the witness to what's going on in life. I notice people want something delicate and light. They come to my gallery and buy the paintings that have nothing about the war. For example, pearl earring. I woke up and the sun is shining brightly. It is strange, but they're looking for a light in my work.
You always wear the source of it. Yes, they look for support, light for waking up in the morning, look at the picture and get the will to live in this tough reality. Our hearts are bleeding. You can't escape war even in the south of London. I'm wondering about the process of creating your works. For example, 20 years ago, there were only love, tenderness, inspiration. Did you need to feel it inside for creating it on your paintings? Always, yes, always. I can work only when everything is good, when I feel happy. All the plots for the paintings, it's like the filling for pie. I should have it inside. It's not the case for me to look at somebody and then paint it. It's always something personal, childhood memory or romantic memory. For instance, my husband helps me with the button at the back or how he kisses my neck. Or like in childhood, I was buying a lucky ticket. It's all about me and I need to feel it all inside. You walk a lot. You say on a good day you wake up at 5 a.m. and start working. It should be a ritual of triggering the happiness inside. For example, cup of tea, beautiful view from the window, the smells. It is necessary. I love green tea. It's my ritual. I love to wake up at 5 a.m. or 4.30 when everyone's asleep. I need my sketchbook. I have all my sketches there, my thoughts, new ideas. Tea is a must-have. Sometimes I read something. I do have the ritual of triggering the happiness. It's true. That's just how it is. Let's go back to 2000s. Your paintings were the most expensive and to have your works in a private collection was prestigious. It is also in trend and in good taste. Your style is very easy to recognize. The copycats of your style easy to spot as well. How does it feel to be successful? How does it taste, feel, energy-wise? Just look at me. I don't even know now. There was one moment when my heart was racing, which might have felt like success. I had a big exhibition at Hanako Museum. I was driving past it and I saw the huge queue for this exhibition and it was wow for me. I could not believe it. It's impossible to understand. I don't understand it even now. I've never had a moment when I would say, what a successful person I am, or I'm so great. Just look at me. I've never had it in my life. There isn't a secret formula or secret to success. There's no way to decode it, how it happened. I've never worked on it. It has just happened without my interfering. I painted and everything else happened by itself. <laughs> it's tempting to ask you when are you planning to start the course successful success, but I understand. It is funny. You see yourself. Do you realize, you may like it or not, but Artinska is a powerful brand? You created it for yourself. <laughs> How many people come to see, to buy, get an inspiration? No. <laughs> it's great that I don't follow it. Mm -hmm. Does it inspire you or support you in the tough moments or it lives separate from you? It surprises me whenever people say it. It always surprises me. Everybody knows I'm a very private person. I'm very down to earth. I'm not sure if I can tell this. I don't go to the beauticians or masseurs. I love painting and love to be left alone. Especially after I had my second child, my life changed completely. I sold all my galleries, I wanted to be with my son, carrying on with my painting and nothing else. People say that when you're 17, 18, 20, 25 years old, your life is full of many things. Lots of socialising, you want a lot and you work a lot. Every meeting is a new potential break. 
and you want to take as much as possible. Then it changes at 30. You take only the necessary. I felt it strongly. I cut down on meetings. Then in 2014, my husband joined the armed forces. In 2016, he got back and we had our second child together. Then it became difficult to look after all my galleries. Every month I had to change to exposition. And when you do it, you need to meet up with the advertising, then to make promotion in every city, city lights, big boards. It all requires a lot of attention. Also, to look after the galleries and the staff, its salaries and everything. Then I realised I wanted to be with my baby, walking with a buggy and to paint. I closed all the galleries in one go. First of all, I was 44 when I had my second baby. It's a different motherhood. It is a different motherhood. You want less and less and less. Now, in the wartime, I have a baby. He is my priority. To look after him takes most of my time and a bit of time I have for my works. I have no energy to work as I used to. I feel like every woman waiting for her husband with a child to look after. I have no outside help, no grandparents, my husband's parents died and mine. Sometimes I feel alone, very, very, very alone. We started with successful success. I don't think I felt it like, oh, I'm so cool, so successful. What's the word? Respectable? Prestigious? Prestigious? Yeah, I was, I always was myself. People imagine me one way and I'm totally different. They imagine me walking on the red carpet and I was never there. What is going on to your husband now after his injury? He is injured, had four surgeries and he's going through one treatment protocol and about to start the second one. The doctor took the tissue from his leg for the arm and it healed for two weeks and then the next surgery. Part of his hip bone was taken to grow arm bones. So they grew the muscle tissue with further implementation of the bones. So he's waiting two weeks for his next operation. There are angels and pink color, golden curls, and all of this doesn't connect with everything you are telling me. It is very tough and tragic experience. It reminds me of something similar in my life. My husband had a very unfortunate accident during tennis game. We played it together. He's a young man and broke his hip. The first six months after the operation and physiotherapy was a very challenging time for him as a young man who lost his mobility and for our family. I can't even imagine what you feel. It wasn't an accident for your husband. Somebody tried to kill him. Everyone is in danger in this country. How is it even possible to carry on creating the world of angels with a pink color and where get the inspiration while you are going through the most challenging time in your life? I will be honest with you. Sometimes I want to stop in the middle of the street and to scream from the pain. I had therapy sessions. There was one and then another. There is no other choice for us. There is a choice to finish your life to stop the pain or getting on with life and painting the beautiful world which still lives inside of me. Because it's still alive. You know, if I stop painting, it means to give the enemy exactly what he wants to take away from you. It sounds dramatic, but it's true. I can slip my veins, it is one option. And it would be easier, because when my house was occupied, not in general meaning like our country, Russians entered my house, they destroyed everything. The roof, walls, everything shot. They robbed it, broke. We were there and waking up in our beds only yesterday. And now we must run with a baby. Everyone was running away. Some were lucky to escape and the rest were not so lucky. In Stoinaka, village near our house, it's on the road. They were shooting and kids were dying like puppies in the back of the car. They were lying down dead there like tiny puppies. I want to tell you this. I came to do this. I want people to hear it. It is the great Russian culture. 
I was raised on it in the art college. Now this Russian culture, Russian ballet, Russian artists, some of. I came to tell you this. I want everybody who loves Russian culture to hear me. This Russian culture came to my my home. They shit all over the house. They smeared the shit all over the place. They were shooting all of it, everything, doors, walls, they were shooting in the child's bedroom. My son's bed was shot. I have all the photographs with everything they had done. I was leaving our house, like in that documentary by Andrei Tasplenko. It's impossible to show on TV because of its graphic content. You can watch only on Telegram. On my road, we lived in Berezivika. We were driving to work through Stoyaka village, Myla and Stoyanka. Andrei was filming in Stoyanka village. This video is from my way to work. There were pulling women, Russians did it. Women and children were pulled from the cars, killed men. They raped women in the forest, then killed women and children. They pulled the dead bodies in one bulk and then they set them on fire, the piles of dead bodies to destroy the evidence of their war crimes. You see, some were lucky to escape. I was lucky to escape. All of those who were unlucky got killed and they can't do the interview. This is hard for me, it is painful, I need specialist help. If I finish my life because of this pain, it's exactly what Putin wants and all of his jerks, these Russian monsters. I want them stopped to be called liberators and orcs. They are Russian citizens. I want this to be known for many generations ahead and they're doing all this nightmare. They do it for their own pleasure. They won't achieve anything. They can only get a short moment of pleasure. I don't understand what's the point. I told you a lot. We have to carry on to create the light and warmth like we always were. Or we can give up to this pain and horror and stop doing it. I'll be honest with you, if my parents were alive, all my in-laws, I would leave my son with them and join the army with my husband to help him there. I was never a girly girl with manicures and pedicures. I was never afraid of dirt and hard work. I have nobody to look after my son. My way to support myself and others is to carry on painting. It's my choice. I have nothing else to do except paint something nice and kind. I'm listening to you and I can't understand. So many people are getting energy from you, from your paintings. Yesterday, when I was preparing for our interview, I checked your Instagram from 2017, 2018. I was looking at what you were painting. There is a universe with angels. I know, you insist, it's not angels, but they are with wings. You created the planet with no pain and traumas, no tears. It's always good. I was looking at it and I felt lovely already. You see, people with good and bad sides in real life, but everybody is adorable in your works. You created a powerful energy. However, talking to you now, all I want is to hug and protect you. I want to create a bubble to protect you. I can't understand how it's all possible. Your energy is so powerful and you are so delicate and vulnerable. Do you have any explanation? Did you think about it? No, I never thought of it. About Russian culture, let's change the subject. During the past two years, since the full-scale invasion, the trend appeared a bit late, but still. Ukrainian artists were returned to Ukraine. In New York Metropolitan Museum, they finally corrected Kuinji, Repin, Ivazovsky. They are all Ukrainian artists. Even the Degas work has been corrected from Russian dancers to Ukrainian dancers. 
I understand Ukraine finally stopped being part of big red Russia on the world maps. Ukraine has appeared on the world maps. What do you think of it as an artist? Did you pay attention earlier? Did you feel uncomfortable? You see, I am from Kharkiv. I was 13 when I went to Kharkiv Art College. Whole syllabus was based on Russian artists. All our practices were in Leningrad. We went to museums. We were copying. My family, my parents, we were all Russian-speaking people. I've never thought of it. It occurred to me in 2014 for the first time when Maidan has started, so to say. The revolution of dignity. Yeah, my husband was an activist on Maidan. It all has started with me for Maidan. I started to realize they wanted to destroy us. It became clear how they leveled and humiliated Ukrainian culture. I grew up in the environment that it never crossed my mind. Never. It's my fault. It is exactly the moment when the victim has been raped and then she's blamed for it because you provoked him with your short skirt, you were passing by. Another example, like in domestic violence, you were beaten because you provoked it, you misbehaved and he didn't hold back. When I started realising this, I felt ashamed how I'd lived all my life and wasn't aware how Ukrainian culture was oppressed. I was afraid to confess publicly about it, I was raised in a different context. I was taken for internships, one museum, then another. It was our syllabus. So everyone who knew about Iva Suk, Ukrainian-speaking teachers' tongues were nailed to the trees for their language in the 1930s. In Transcarpathia by Russian NKVDs, I did not know. I was afraid to say it, because those who knew, I can imagine them in front of the TV saying, why wasn't you interested? Why haven't you tried to buy the literature on this subject? I didn't know it was there. I was always ashamed to say about it. I was ashamed to say that our teachers fought and those who wrote our syllabus in colleges and universities. And then I've heard a Ukrainian culture expert. She explained it as a cultural occupation. At that point, I realized everything that was done to me before my 20s was a cultural occupation. It wasn't my fault. It was cultural occupation, and I grew up in it. I feel sorry for the 10-year-old kids in Crimea. They live under cultural occupation. They were eight years old, just a child, and it's ten years since the annexation. They grew up in these circumstances with this school syllabus. This 18-year-old child will be sent to war against Ukrainians after everything was said about us triggers the hate. Eager to kill us all, as they understand it. I went through the same, but culturally. I have works like that, but they're not on the canvases. It's like a sketch. The Russian doll cracked and a small skinny man came out of it, wrapped in the Ukrainian flag, titled From Captivity. When the war prisoners exchange, they are all skinny and wrapped in the flags like skeletons. I drew cracked Russian dolls. Russian dolls always smile with red cheeks, but this one cracked and captured skinny Ukrainian. For me, it's a symbol. Did you know that the Russians stole this doll from the Japanese? They stole, and now they claim it as a Russian doll, and it became the symbol of the country, but only the Japanese know that it's theirs. This Russian doll became a disgusting symbol for me. It's like a dead dog's body about to explode from the leeches. Russian culture turned out to be a dead dog. Russian doll full of leeches and about to explode. It was a video, I think, from the summer of 2022, when a Russian soldier was taken into captivity, his arm covered with sellotape. The heat was unbearable, 40 degrees Celsius or so. Ukrainian servicemen pulled the sellotape and the leeches fell out of it. Our soldier screamed in disgust. It's Russian culture for me. It's so beautiful, their ballet and the paintings are lovely. Leningrad and its ballet school, everything's so beautiful. But if you take off the bit of it 
and they are their soldier who shit all over your house. There is an exhibition of destroyed art. You can see the church icons covered with their excrements. Great Russian culture turned out to be full of disgusting things. It's not what we thought of it. It was very painful for me. I started writing the article, but I couldn't finish it. When my house was destroyed, I had in the safe 400,000 US dollars after I sold the gallery. Of course they took it. Lawyers called me, offered free of charge to file a lawsuit in the European Court of Justice. They were preparing the case. All the witnesses were interviewed, including our neighbours and our driver, Siryorja. He was the first one to enter the house after liberation of Kiev region. He was the first one to come in and take the photographs. The lawyers offered me to write about it. I started writing, but still need to finish it. The most shocking for me was this disappointment, the cultural disappointment. I am a woman. I've always thought, when I started to write the article about my house, I could not understand why all these disgusting things happened. Why these excrements? Why? What's the point? You can ruin the house, but why do you need to shit in it? What's the point of killing a child on the road? Why? Why? I thought I was going to write about it, but when I was writing, it was about my cultural disappointment. I was admiring Russian culture and art very much, and it's turned out to be absolutely disgusting. Britannia. Do you follow the news? Do you have a favorite Brit? Possibly the British royal family? Only Johnson. He is so lovely. He's so lovely. His hair is adorable. He possibly looks like me. It's a strange combination of a newborn duckling, his yellow hairstyle, like a duckling is just hatched and come out of the eggshell. He has a strong, brave heart and stamina. I like him very much. I also like the Queen. I drew her long before the war, and Italians commissioned it for the calendar with famous people in my funny style. I drew for them Einstein and Maradona. They chose themselves the list of people. The Queen was in the list. Of course, she is so adorable. Interesting. Enough the combination of a petite figure and the steel stamina. I loved her violet outfits. She reminds me of a delicate crocus that wakes up with a spring. What a strong person she was inside. I would choose those two outstanding people. If you had dinner with the Queen or Boris Johnson, what would you ask them? Whom would you choose? I wouldn't choose. I would dine with both of them, ask something about love and have her husband call her cabbage. I'm still trying to figure out what I would ask Boris Johnson. It could be something about children or something girly. Do you have dreams? Only about our victory. How do you imagine it? It is very painful. It's not glorious with balloons and music for me. I might be crying a lot. I know my husband's friends who died. I know how he was crying and wailing. I don't know about many. There was one. My husband was already injured in the hospital. His friend, Lyosha, died. My husband was screaming. Only not Lyosha, anyone but him. My victory will associate with Vanya, who died, Grigorovich, Lyosha, Yarik. Also, I see victory with horrible nonsense. When we win, I will be asking God, why was this nonsense? What's the point? Why? 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 God allowed it. Why? That's how I imagine the victory. I'm going to ask why. Children left without parents, and these kids did the interview. They are 15 years old or something, when they were asked what war is like. They answered it. It was complete nonsense. I often ask my husband, Dima, why Russia does it. Even if they kill the last Ukrainian in the world, there's nothing for them. Nothing will change for them. What's the point? There is no point. It's a pleasure 
during the process. The victory will be about the pain and inability to understand everything that happened. That's what I think. Thank you for watching today. It was pockets of joy, happiness, sorrow, loss, and lots of grief from Ukrainian artist uh, Evgenia Kapchinska. Please don't forget, like, share, subscribe, and share your thoughts in the comments. I definitely will read it. Thank you.